And by the honor, will you please rise, Parker, for first hymn number 336. <laughs> Good 
actions. There are things that we think that we should do, the act that separates for us from God. The church calls that sin. Let us confess our sins to God in the presence of each other. You may be seated. Let us pray. God of all mercy, I confess that sin grips me and I cannot break free. The sins in my mind, on my lips, and in my acts, done and even ignored, stand between me and you. My entire heart is not always yours. My love of neighbor falls short. In the name of Jesus, have mercy on me. Grant me your renewing forgiveness. Lead me on the paths of righteousness, and I shall delight in you, and I shall follow you, giving glory to your holy name, through Jesus Christ.
the end of the month meant two things. The great reports would be out soon, so I wanted to make sure they were good because I would get a call from my mother and my father if my grades weren't uh, where they were supposed to be. And also my spending money for the month was almost gone. Grades I could handle, but no pizza money. That was intolerable. Couldn't handle that. It seemed to me that the quality of our cafeteria meals would decline as the month went on. As I ran out of money, they got worse and worse. I don't think that was actually the reality, but it seemed that way when I had no other choice. When I had to eat what was in the cafeteria, I felt like it was getting worse. But most of the guys in my floor were the same, in the same boat. We were all out of money by the end of the month. So we would get together. We would call our parents. We'd beg for more money, which never worked for me. They'd say, well, we give you money every month. You're going to have to live with it for me. Uh, yeah, right. But we all got that thing. But in the interim time, wait for the next month to come in. We would pull our pennies, comb our desks for coupons, order a simple, large cheese pizza. The cheapest thing, the biggest thing we could get for as little amount of money as possible. An amazing thing occurred when we did that. As we joined for the meal, suddenly six of us could eat from one pizza and be satisfied. Any other time, we would order a bunch of pizzas, and they would all disappear. But this time, we would split one pizza, because we knew somebody would have some chips, or pretzels, or something else. Somebody would have a two liter of pop, or something, and we would make it go as far as we could. There was one guy who always had cookies from home to share. He was very popular among us, because his mother always sent him cookies, always sent him a box of junk food, so we knew we could count on him to bring something to the table. Now some of you folks may remember a time when families didn't have enough to eat any time during the month. And I was very fortunate, I didn't grow up that way. I, we always had more than enough food. But I can remember the stories my grandparents would tell me about living through the Depression. And they lived on a farm, so you'd think food would not be a problem, but it was. Because even then, it was still tough because money was tight, people didn't have a lot, so you were maybe a little bit more careful about what you did have and a little more thankful for what you had. I saw a scene years ago from the Charlie Chaplin movie. And in the film, the little tramp oils an old shoe. You heard me right, a shoe, a leather shoe. And then he eats it. He cuts it up with a knife and fork and he eats it. Maybe some of you remember have seen that movie. It's, it, it, I don't, couldn't even tell you when it was made or what the title was. But that scene always stuck with me, the little tramp eating the shoe. <laughs> And he twirls the shoelaces like spaghetti. That was the thing I really remember the most. He chews them, and he just chews and chews and chews. He was so hungry. He had nothing else to eat. Now, a few people have shared with me how your families lived during the Great Depression and other times of great difficulty. You may not have eaten old footwear, but you knew how to make food stretch. You knew that you could add more and more water to the soup, and eventually it was nothing but thin broth, but it was still something. Better than nothing, right? Our gospel lesson for today describes one of the most popular miracles in the Bible, one that we talk about all the time. Jesus and the disciples are seeking a little time alone to rest. They go to a deserted place, but the crowd soon finds them, soon follows them, and they come to Jesus for more of his teaching. Jesus speaks to them all day until evening. As the text says, he has compassion for them. He sees these people yearning for God's word, yearning to be healed, yearning to see something in their lives. And he has this compassion for them. So even though he was tired, even though the disciples wanted to rest, he gets out of the boat and heals their sick and he teaches them. And as the hours go by, eventually it's getting close to evening and the disciples say to Jesus, it's late, send everybody into the village to buy some food. Send them away. I'm sure they just wanted to rest. I'm sure they could see Jesus was tired. They just wanted a little time. But Jesus says to his friends, you feed them, to the disciples, you feed them. And we know from the rest of the text there were thousands of people gathering in this field, in this empty field by the lake, waiting to hear the word. And I'm sure the disciples looked out there and said, that's not possible. We only have five loaves of bread and two fish. Five loaves and two fish, barely enough to feed the disciples of Jesus. And you want us to feed everybody. Jesus tells everybody in standing out in the field, sit down in the grass. 
and he holds up the meager ration that the disciples had in his prayer. And then he blessed and he broke the loaves and he began to distribute them to the hungry crowd. The baskets didn't empty. They kept getting passed around, and they didn't get empty. Each person took a share and ate. 5,000 men, plus women and children, gathered and consumed their fill and were satisfied. All of those people ate, and the baskets kept going around. And Jesus tells them, gather up the leftovers. You know, you don't throw away the leftovers. They gather them up, and they have 12 baskets full of leftovers. And that's very significant. It means they had more left over than what they started with. That ends the miracle. The food divided, the food grew, the blessings grew. All ate and were satisfied. Jesus had them collect these crumbs. And imagine that for just a minute, receiving back all of those baskets, knowing what miracle he had just witnessed. I'm sure the people sitting way in the back probably didn't even understand what was happening. They just got the basket passed to them, they took what they wanted to eat and passed it along. Maybe they didn't even realize that they were part of the miracle. I'm wondering how many of those 5,000 people realized what had happened right in front of them, realized that the food they ate came directly from the hand of God. I don't know if they recognized it or not. Why did Jesus keep the crowd in the first place? Well, the folks were yearning for God's word, and that's what he was there for. They listened to Jesus, and they wanted to hear more. Jesus didn't send them away because God doesn't push away those who seek him in faith. He welcomed them. Despite being tired, despite needing time for himself, he kept them there so he could continue to teach. He will not let a little thing like hunger separate them or us from him. Jesus was proving a point to the disciples. God will provide. Trust him for all your needs. The disciples were thinking like we are. They see a big crowd of people and panic. What are we going to do? How are we going to feed them? Have you ever had that happen at your home where you get company by surprise? You know, a big family shows up with visitors, and you have nothing to feed them? Just a few weeks ago, my son's friends from college, a bunch of them all showed up at the house. We had all these kids there. And I said to Chris, what are you going to do? I said, she said, well, just call them for pizza. We don't, have, we don't have anything else to feed them. Have you ever seen a bunch of teenage boys plowing the creek? It's pretty, it, it's pretty dangerous. You have to be careful. So we ordered food. But Jesus' disciples didn't have that option. All they had was what was on hand. Five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus didn't make the loaves and the fish from thin air. He took what the disciples had and he used it to serve his purpose. This is the way God works with all of us. We have a few gifts to offer and God multiplies that and do a great blessing for many. God can create anything from nothing. Yet he chooses to use us and the resources that we already possess, the ones he's given us from birth, the ones that we earn for ourselves, the ones that we build, the things that we have. And each of us has something. You may not think about it, but each of us has something we can give. You may think to yourself, well, I don't really have anything. I don't really have much to give. But you do have something. Everyone does. There are people that can't do anything else, but they can still pray for us. They can still say their prayers for each one of us. They can read our prayer list and bulletin, things like that, and do that for us. That's part of what God would have us do. It applies to the church as well. As a whole, our congregations have been blessed with many gifts, and each member has something to contribute to the whole. Every family has an offering acceptable to God, but we have to be willing to share. We have to be willing to see it be multiplied. And not think to ourselves, well, it's not worthy of giving because it's too small. There is no gift for God that's too small. The only gift that's too small is the one that you withhold, the one that you refuse to give because you're embarrassed. God doesn't look at it that way. God takes whatever we have, whether it's two loaves, two, five loaves and two fish, or whatever we have, and he multiplies it because we bring them together to make the disciple. We need to remember that the one person the one family can't be the church alone. God doesn't call many to church to sit back and watch. A few do all the work. Now, how many times have you seen that where you, you drive past the construction site and you see a whole bunch of guys standing around doing whatever they're doing, and then you just see one or two guys actually digging and doing all that work? My son and I still laugh at that when we see it. And I said, well, every job needs a boss, right? 
And sometimes it seems there are more bosses than workers. It just seems that. Now, it, it, I know it's not really that way, but it's just that illusion. We should never let that happen. We should all know that what we have to offer is valuable and true. And we should also remember that there are those people who have something to offer, and we shouldn't turn them away because we don't understand what their gifts are useful for. That's another thing that the God gives to us. You could have easily said, the disciples could have said, well, nobody wants to eat fish. You know, only certain people like fish, so we're not going to share that. We'll just share the bread. But they didn't. They just had what they had. And the people ate and were full. We have to be willing to do that. If God has called you to be here, he expects you to work. He expects us to do what we are called to do. Even now, even when we're faced with the pandemic, as we were joking before, it, you, will, you might want to stay home in your pajamas, and that's an awesome thing to do any morning of the week, which is sort of sit around and, and not, not worry about getting out doing things. But even that gets boring after a while. But God still has work for us to do. Call your neighbor. Check on somebody around you. Call your friends. Reach out on the internet. Reach out on Facebook. Whatever it is. There are lots of people that just need somebody to contact. I talked to a friend of mine from college yesterday on the phone. And as my son can tell you, we were on the phone for over an hour because we hadn't talked to each other for a while. And he said to me, I have been so bored. He said, I could go, I went an entire two or three weeks without talking to a person in person. And I didn't think about that because he lives alone, he has a condo, he kind of got put, you know, on lockdown. He's got health problems, so he didn't want to go out. Well, there he is. I could go all that time without speaking to a person in person. Never occurred to me how difficult that could be. But for some of us, that's maybe what we can do. Talk to people. Maybe you can't see them in person, but you can still call them. It's not your concern. God offers us love and grace for free, but we're expected to share the joy and the gospel and serve the mission of the church in whatever way is possible. And that's what we have to do now, especially during these difficult times. There are ways we can still share the gospel, ways that we haven't thought of yet. That's why we have to come together, use our imaginations, and do things differently, respond to what's going on around us. That's what the church has always done over the centuries, respond to what's happening. Do things differently if we have to, because getting the word out is still our primary focus, our primary job, the very mission that God has given us. Often we are focused on the scarcity of our gifts more so than how much we have. We think about what we don't have. Isn't that the way a lot of us look at life? You look at your bank account and you think about how much money you don't have rather than how much you do. Or you look at the gauge on your car, the gas gauge, and you think to yourself, I'm running out of gas. I only have three quarters of a tank. And you don't think that way. So many of us, you're a glass full or glass half empty kind of person. But God tells us, look at the gifts you have and know that if you use them for God's sake, he will make them more abundant. Multiply. The mission God has given us is to spread the message of Christ. The church is alive with the abundant love of Christ. And to have a human fear results in a lack of faith and vision, a lack of generosity, a lack of hope. And that's something we suffer from today, especially right now, when we see a lot of things going wrong in the world, and we see all of our faults being highlighted. We forget that there is still faith, there is still life, there is still hope to be found in all things. Usually in the summer, we meet sometime in this month, and sometimes in this very week, this very Sunday, we meet for our church picnic. We have a good time. Everybody brings something to share. Everybody has something for the event. Most of you have a, a specialty that you like to bring to the picnic every year. You know what I bring? I bring my, my, my famous meatballs. My kids drive me crazy, so I make them. And that's what I bring. Each part, each of us brings something to be part of a bigger meal. No one dish is a meal all to itself. Imagine if all of us showed up to the next church picnic with potato salad. Everybody. Everybody brought a bowl of potato salad. Now that would be great if you love potato salad. And I do like potato salad. I don't want seven bowls of it for a meal. But imagine that. But no. Our suppers, our picnics do well because we each bring something different. Because everybody brings something special, special to them and then special to the group. The whole church is just like that in many ways. We're like a big potluck supper. 
We each book, we each bank, and then we carry our creations to serve the greater congregation. If we bring on Jesus what we have, Jesus will multiply all of those blessings and show us God's love. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping us to gather our gifts together and to share them. Just like the disciples shared the loaves and the fishes, we ask that you help us to gather our gifts together, to recognize them for the wonder that they are, to give thanks for them, and then to put them to work where we can watch you multiply them and spread them across the world as we share the gospel. Lord, we ask that you give us the courage and the wisdom to do these things in your name. We ask all of this in the way that Jesus prayed, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I mentioned every week, this is the time we normally gather the offering together, but we still have the plates at the front back of the church. And I give thanks and I encourage everyone who is watching us on the internet to continue mailing in your, your offerings. That's so important for both of our congregations and for the church as a whole. There are still many places that are in need. Uh, we still have a food bank that's uh, in need that is sending out uh, pleas for help and more items. So if you can help any of those places, do so as well. There is no shortage of need. You might only have to look next door to find uh, somebody who needs help. So I ask you to please continue being generous, not only with the church, but uh, with all those people around us, all of our neighbors who are in need. Amen. I ask everyone who are able to please rise for our final hymn, number 86, for the morning gilds the skies. <laughs>
taken a few loaves and fish, present them to God, our small gifts will be transformed into great blessings. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.